Good morning, everybody. I'm Ellen Pryor, and I'm the Director of Communications here at the Frist Center. And it is um, a pleasure to welcome you all today uh, to hear a talk by Richard Casper, uh, who is just back from his honeymoon. I want to acknowledge the most lovely Ashley, who is with us this morning, his new bride. Um, And Richard's talk today is being offered in support of uh, and in conjunction with our current exhibition, World War I and American Art, which is in the Ingram Gallery. And the stickers you have today are your entry into the galleries. Um, uh, World War I and American Art is, uh, is an amazing opportunity to view uh, World War I, the Forgotten War, through the eyes of American artists. It is extraordinary. When it leaves here, it will be gone forever. So I encourage you, if you have not seen it, to go on, go on in there. And following Richard's presentation this morning, uh, we will have, uh, we've got microphones for any of you who, who want uh, to ask him some questions. And as always, we want to acknowledge the Metropolitan National Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their support of uh, the Frist Center. And our local sponsors for World War I and American Art include our platinum sponsors, HCA Foundation on behalf of HCA TriStar Health, our silver sponsor, Ameriprise Financial, our partner sponsor, Cracker Barrel, and our hospitality sponsor, Union Station, our neighbor next door. We also want to express our gratitude to the Frist Center's Friends of American Arts group for their support of this particular exhibition. You know, we at the Frist work with our area's military community throughout the year uh, and, and have done so for a number of years. But, but most especially during times when we have exhibitions like World War I and American Art, which uh, really resonate with those who are in service and those who have served. It was members of our military community who taught us and encouraged us to use exhibitions like World War I and American Art to amplify our efforts uh, to reach service members past and present and further to find ways to offer our civilian visitors a current context in order to help deepen their understanding of war and its lasting impact. One veteran told me a number of years ago, and it, please forgive me, it gets very emotional. The words we use to describe war and the aftermath of war may change, but no matter the era, war is war is war, and it touches all of us. And I think we see that today. We saw it during World War I and we see it today. The advice we received from our military friends has had a profound and lasting and durable effect on the Frist Center. This past April, as we focused our attention on the World War I exhibition, uh, Ann Pope, who is the executive director of the Tennessee Arts Commission, approached our executive director, Susan Edwards, and she was looking for a site to host a meeting uh, that would be jointly presented by the Tennessee Arts Commission and the Kentucky Arts Commission. And the purpose of the meeting uh, was to offer representatives of the Department of Defense uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Americans for the Arts, an opportunity to meet people in the arts in Kentucky and Tennessee, specifically because uh, Fort Campbell straddles, as you know, the border between Kentucky and Tennessee. They wanted to discuss and share ideas to build effective programs and engagement opportunities to support the healing and well-being of military service members and those who have served particularly those who are confronting challenges of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. It was at this meeting that we first met Richard Casper. And when he introduced himself to the group, it was quickly clear. He spoke with knowing conviction, representing a number of constituencies. He spoke as a veteran of combat. He was a member of the United States Marine Corps. He served President George W. Bush at Camp David and then volunteered to serve in Iraq. And while in Iraq, he suffered IED explosions that left him with both traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. He spoke as an artist and a teacher. Following his service, he discovered art as a means of expressing himself to deal with the aftermath of his wartime experience. He received BFA, his BFA degree in 2012 from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and now teaches there and at Virginia Commonwealth University. He co-founded an organization you'll hear about a little bit more today, Creative Vets, um, in order to help veterans use art and music to heal their unseen uh, wounds of war. And as you will soon see, Richard is also a vocal an eloquent advocate for the arts. Following the meeting today, we, following the meeting that day, we immediately asked him to come and visit and, and asked if we couldn't sit down to begin to explore the ways we might join with him to serve our military community in Middle Tennessee and Kentucky, our, our surrounding area. And today is the first result of those talks. Richard has been recognized widely for his important work 
And I don't know if you saw, but there is a current issue of Time magazine out on the table in which Richard was featured. Um, he's been named one of Time magazine's next generation leaders. He joins a phenomenal group of leaders in many fields, not just from America, but from around the world. Emily? It's an honor to welcome Richard Casper to the Frist today and to thank you for your service, past and present. Thank you, everyone. I'm still, that, that time video, I can't, I have to turn away because the part of me tearing up still makes me tear up. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out today, uh, bearing this weather and, and coming to hear me speak. I actually don't like speaking in front of people, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, eight years ago, I had to do one-on-one -on -one speeches with my speech teacher in college because I couldn't get up in front of class and talk to people. And that just shows you what art can do for you. And I want to start by saying, because you see me as the person now who I am today, but I want to show you who I was before. This is uh, me before war. I'm that, that guy right in the middle. <laughs> Notice the hair. I, at one point, I even had those like blonde tips in my hair. It was really cool. I had a bull cut. Because um, that's what it was. I was the life of the party. I was class clown, prom king. It was just, it was amazing. I loved, I loved being in high school. I loved being that kid. I was also six foot three, but I was only 155 pounds. So I wasn't, um, I didn't look as much like I did today. <laughs> it was, it was amazing. Uh, I came from a town of a population of 1,100 people. It's actually that town that you saw on that little video that Time did for me. And this is just kind of set up to show you there's, there's a lot of different, there was me back then, and then there's wartime me, and then there's me now. And you'll see I'm more like this than I ever was, and it was all because of art. Um, after high school, I was always optimistic. I was like, after 9-11 happened, I, I just wanted to go to war. I already was writing I was writing papers about Saddam Hussein before 9-11 even happened, saying how evil he was and how I needed to be over there, how I needed to stop him. Why couldn't I be that person to stop him? Someone has to do it. So I was like, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. I'm going to be the first one over there, and I'm going to find him. And that's what I tried to do. But I actually got sidetracked. Uh, I ended up at Camp David. <laughs> so. I went to boot camp, and I was always, this is 2003, height of the war, I'm ready. I didn't have a, a summer, a senior summer, I just went straight into the military. And they came in, and this is, this, I know my buddy Chad loves this story, but they come in, and this is boot camp, where all, everything's going crazy, and they come in and say, Richard, you're a special tester. And I'm like, crap, they know I'm dumb. <laughs> I'm like, what does this special test mean? I, I had no idea what it meant. Um, little did I know that it wasn't because I was dumb. It was actually because I was selected for a unique opportunity. And at that point, I didn't know what it was. This is still boot camp. We started with about 400 people. All of a sudden, we went to a whole bunch of different meetings, a lot of different psychologists and doctors. And then by the end of it, two months later, there's like 14 or 15 of us. And that's when they tell us, they're like, you've been selected to guard the President of the United States. So you get to either go to White House Communications or Camp David. and, and 
I was like, I want Camp David. I'm a small town. I'm a small town guy, and I wanted that small town feel. And Camp David is just up in the mountains, and you get more interaction with President Bush, and that's what I wanted. I was like, I want to be his friend. <laughs> he seemed funny to me at the time. I was like, we can hang out. Problem was, they didn't let you hang out with him. You get up there, and they put you in these white cloaks, and when it's snowing out, and you're out in the woods while he's riding his bike around the thing, and you want to be like, hey, but you have to look down the range, and you're like, dang it. Uh, <laughs> so. I was up there for a good three years. My mom loved it because she knew this 2000 war or 2003, the war's going on, and I got selected for this. And then it came a time where they asked me if I wanted to stay, and I wanted to stay at Camp David and and kind of ride out the rest of my term because I have a four-year term. And I said no. I was like, I enlisted because I wanted to go overseas, and I know if I never went to war, I'd regret it when I came home. Um, so I went to the first people who were going to war. I went to 27, a unit called 27. And if you know, the New York Times just wrote a big article about them about a year ago about all the suicide rate because how hard they were hit. I only actually got to stay with them for about four months while I was in the Marine Corps because, again, I hit this roadblock where I was, I was in it, I was training to go to war, and they said, hey, by the way, you don't meet the deployment time frame. You get out in July or June of 2007. We get back in, in August, uh, so you can't go to war with us. So I was like, well, send me to the next people who are deploying. So they sent me to 1st Tank Battalion, and I ended up deploying uh, in 2006 to Iraq uh, with a tow platoon. So now here's me in Iraq. Boom. Still had it. I still had that thing going for me. I was, I was still life at the party. This was before anything happened to me. And uh, it's, I was at the peak of it. So in high school, this is all I wanted to do. I wanted to go to war. I can't, it was like a roller coaster ride. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm guarding the President of the United States. How's it get better than this? But for me, this was the biggest place I wanted to be. I wanted to serve my country. So while I was over there, it didn't take long for me to realize, uh, uh, not even realize, it just didn't take long for me to be hit by an IED. <laughs> it, took, it was in November. I got there in October, and by November, I was hit by an IED. First one, no concussion, but I did tear cartilage in my chest. Um, but I still had this kind of God complex about it, like, okay, I was hit once, nothing happened, okay, let's keep going. In December, my best friend was shot and killed beside me, and that's still hard to talk about. Uh, he, was, he was my gunner, and he was, he was sniped out of the truck, and that has been the thing that stuck with me the most. But it didn't stop there, cause, so that was November, then December, then January 1st, I got hit by another IED uh, with a concussion, and then January 17th, another concussion. And then February 13th, I got another concussion. And so four times I was hit, and uh, I couldn't work after that. They said I was unfit for duty. My brain was too injured. Uh, but they kept me in Iraq, and I just, for the next four months, I kind of, I just worked it out to live on the base and do everything that they wanted me to there. But because I had four months of downtime where they didn't send me to get treated for my brain injury, they didn't know I had one at the time, but I think they just kind of swept it under the rug as another you know, casualty, but let's keep them working. So I had to extend a month just to go to war. And so when I came home, I was like, I think I'm good. They asked me, do you want, are you okay? As you, do you feel like you're injured? I had four months of downtime kind of. I was still working, but I wasn't using my brain. So I was like, I think I'm good. I, I guess I'm good. I just signed out of the Marine Corps and left. And it wasn't, I took six months off and just enjoyed my life, freedom. I was, I took my Harley to Sturgis. I did everything I wanted to do. Uh, came home, was like, okay, sweet. It's time to enroll in college, get a degree. Uh, I decided to enroll into a business degree at a com local community college near my hometown, and I ended up failing my very first class. And I didn't know what was wrong. And so I was like, you know what, maybe business isn't for me. I'm just gonna go do something else. I'm gonna get all my, my gen eds done first. And then I started getting sick before class, and I started throwing up, and I started not being able to go to school anymore. And I was becoming a recluse in my own house. I've been trapped in my own house. And I always wanted to, to achieve more. And I, I still was optimistic about life. And I wanted to keep going on. So I chose a degree in art. And the only reason I did that wasn't because I wanted to be an artist. It wasn't because I was an artist before, because I wasn't. I didn't play guitar. I didn't make art. I, uh, I was a good draftsman. I could draw pretty well. But I, wasn't, I wouldn't consider myself an artist. I did it because I could know, I knew I could be by myself and I could be in a room, nobody can bother me. And I could just sit there and do nothing. I, I was like, honestly, I was like, easy degree in art, woo! Um, 
but it ended up changing my life. And I want to, and that's where this kind of, this goes into my journey through art. And it's going to go a little bit of an artist talk. Um, you're going to see from my very beginning pieces all the way to some of my last pieces and see what I was going through. And I'm going to talk a lot about what I was going through for any veterans in the room who, I, when I teach at the School of Art Institute of Chicago and VCU, a lot of times it triggers some people just because I get pretty in depth in how I was feeling at the time because I want everyone else to know what we're going through at the time. So if zero was killing yourself and 100 was who you were before war, I was probably about a nine when I chose to do art. Um, and that was a last ditch effort. And I really, if I never went to, to do art, I don't know where I would end up, but I wouldn't, I would be lower than a nine, that's for sure. And so I dove into art and I was in my first class, I was in a drawing class, doing everything I wanted to. I mean, I had cut off shirts, I had a Harley, I had, you know, I had my cami shorts. I, f I acted like nobody knew what I did in war and, and that I was even over there. I had a tattoo of, of Luke on my shoulder. Um, I just kind of blurred everyone out and I was like, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm drawing, I'm painting. Nobody asked me questions about what I went through. I didn't want to tell anybody what I went through. As veterans who've been to war, we only trust other veterans who've been to war. So it's hard to, to open up to civilians. And one day I had a, I had this photo that was taken of me at my gunner's grave. So every year I go to Houston to spend time with my gunner's family who shot and killed, and I visit his grave. My uncle took a photo of my me, my arm, up on his headstone. And so I, I was getting pretty good at drawing, and, and, and we were starting to do chalk pastels, first time I was ever doing that. And so I go into class, and I was like, I just really want to do this photo. So I, I, get, I get this seat that's like away from everyone else, because everyone usually sits in like a circle issue, you find your own spots, and I just, move my away from everyone because I'm finally diving into something that actually means something to me and I still didn't want people to know, but I had to get it out there. And uh, I'm gonna show you the piece, but this is the piece I ended up with. But when I first started it, it wasn't meant to be all red. I was sitting there in class and I'm so thankful to have this teacher that I did at this community college in uh, Bloomington, Illinois. But I had everything. All this was like roses. I had this right here colored in. Um, I had my arm, everything was colored in normal natural colors. So I got to the background and my teacher comes up to me and he already knows about what I went through a little bit because before I went to teach class, I had to tell someone what I went through. So I told the teacher, I was like, hey, I've been to war. I have a brain injury, PTS. I can't really talk about a lot of this stuff. So he knew a little bit about the background, but he didn't know the full story. And so he comes up to me and says, Richard, instead of doing the background green like you're going to for grass, I just want to challenge you, do it a color that doesn't make sense on paper, but it makes sense to the way you feel. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> it looks so good. But I ended up doing it. I dived into it, and I really thought about color as an emotion. And so I put red on there all over it. And the fun thing about art classes is that you have to do critiques. And typically, my critiques before that, they weren't anything special. I just put up some work, and we talk about it. And so we put up this piece of artwork, and everybody else's and it gets to me. And they're like, Richard, would you like to talk about your piece at all? Nope, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to just look at it. Isn't it cool? <laughs> uh, and then so he opens it up to the rest of the class and the rest of the class starts talking. They're like, I think you put red in there because you saw him die. Or I think you put red in there because you loved him, because you're passionate about him. Sorry, I get emotional. Uh, <laughs> and so all of a sudden I'm hearing from all these people my story. And I'm like, I never told a soul what I went through. How do they know what I went through just from a color? So I started diving just deep into this whole concept of, of color and using, using symbols to tell my story. And I was like, what else can I tell these people without physically talking about it? Because that's the thing. We want to tell you, but we don't want to tell you. We don't know how to open up to you. They teach us how to be not vulnerable. And now all of a sudden we being vulnerable to you, we're like, no, we can't do this. We can't show emotion. This was the perfect blend between both for me because I was able to put this in a room and walk away and understand that they get it. And even if they didn't get it, knowing that someone did, I now think everyone does. Everyone that sees my piece, I don't have to talk to you because I know you get it to me. It's, it's an amazing feeling. And so that led me to start doing more pieces. Um, one of my first paintings I did, um, very first paintings I did, was this. And uh, for the longest time, I didn't even tell people what this was about because it, this, 
it was, it was, again, it was hard to talk about. I was painting these things. And the great thing about art is that you could hide a lot of things. You could tell one person a story and tell another person a different story, and it could mean the same thing. So if a combat veteran comes up to me, I tell them what this means. If a civilian comes up to me, I just talk about my time in Iraq and how it aged me and how it keeps going. But the, the truth is that uh, you can't see it as well up on here, but there's this, this little red spot. And so this is actually the same road. This and this are the same road, but they're just mirrored images from me before Luke was shot and killed to the way I viewed the road after Luke was shot and killed. So it never looked the same to me after that. Um, everything's just tattered and torn. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized where I was and how, how ugly that country was to me and, and how I'd never forget the spot that he was shot and killed because every day we went back on that same road he was shot and killed. I had to just put another person up in my gun and keep going the next day like nothing happened. And, and we'd drive over that spot. And I knew everyone else in the truck was like, they all felt that. And so I had to get that out of me. Um, this all led to an amazing opportunity where the, uh, so I said I wasn't an artist before. Didn't know anything about art. And the School Art Institute of Chicago, they had, a <laughs> they had a representative that came down. And they're talking about their school. And I was like, what is this school? The school? I was like, it's in Chicago. It's in Illinois? Sweet. It's like in our backyard. And they're like, this is one of the, the best art schools in the country. Walt Disney, George O'Keefe, a bunch of people went here. Uh, very prestigious. So I was like, why not just go for it, you know? So I asked my teacher, Mac, I was like, what do you think? And he's like, you've been studying art for like a year and a half? He's like, don't do it. <laughs> he's like, I just don't want you to get your... He was a great teacher. He's like, I just don't want you to get your feelings hurt. He's like, this is like top of the top. People stay their whole life to get into the school or they have a bunch of money to back them to get to the school, which I had neither. Um, but like I said, I was always optimistic and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So it was the only school I actually applied for. Uh, I went to the admissions office and I only had about 15 pieces because that's all I had time to create in this, at this community college. And I showed them my pieces and they were looking at it and they're like, you know, we can tell you're a good draftsman and you have some content in here, but we're more about the bigger picture we're about concept we want story we want like new innovative stuff so i said well let me tell you what i want to create i was limited at a community college by having a teacher that had to teach me things i had i had to do these little art projects uh to get through and pass but here's what i want to do i want you to know what it feels like to be blown up i was like i want you to know what it looks like to see someone die like what that loss of innocence feels like i want i want to capture that in art and i know that i could do that at this school so they brought in someone else uh, to kind of review and hear my spiel again, and they let me in. They let me into the school. I was, that moment, I was just, I was on cloud nine. I just, I, I saw that mountaintop. Again, I was like down, down in a, in a nine zone, and then all of a sudden I got into the school, and I was, I was climbing that mountain. I was just learning more and more, but when I got there, I still, there was still a lot of anxiety. The community college did so much to open the doors to what art can do, but by the time I got to the school in Chicago, I was still... I was shaken. I didn't know. I, I thought I was going to have the same problems I did when I went to the community college. Uh, and so I went to orientation. So they make new students and freshmen go to the orientation. I went to this big auditorium, all these big tables. I go there. I find a seat in the back. I just sit down at this round table. Because at the time, I still couldn't do one-on-one -on -one speeches with people, or I had to do one-on-one -on -one speeches with people because my anxieties were so bad. So I knew if I sat in the back, nobody would notice me. I could just chill, see what was up with the school, and I could just leave after that. So I went in there, I sat down, and then at this table, this mom and dad sit down with their kid, who's obviously a freshman artist kid who just got to the school, and he's, he's just looking down. And so this is a perfect opportunity for his parents to try to make me his friend. <laughs> So they're just like, what are you doing? What are you here for? And I'm, I'm just talking a little bit because they're, they're, since they're there, I'm, I'm open to talking to them. And you can tell he wants no part of this. He's like, just grab mom. Like, I can make my own friends kind of thing. Um, and little did I know that that actual interaction saved me a little bit later down the road. But from that moment, all of a sudden they said, okay, now we're going to break up into groups. And again, I still couldn't break up in a group. I, I could never be the center of attention. After a war, it was something about being the center of attention that led me to my anxiety, my depression, my throwing up and getting sick. And so every time they said, now let's split up into groups, we're gonna do tours, I bounced. I, I went back to my room and locked myself in there and just started doing art. I couldn't, I was still so anxious. I was like, I don't know if I could even be a part of this school because what if I can't even do normal interactions? So the next day, they have the next day of orientation. I do the same thing, go sit in the back, they break into groups, I can't do it again, so I just walk away. So I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna, 
I'm just going to go to my first class. I'm going to be super early. I'm going to, I always carried a bottle of water back then because I'd always get so, my throat would get so dry. I would carry water everywhere with me. And so I went almost like a half hour early and I get there to the, where the room's at. There's no windows. I was like, I can't go in here unless I see who's in here. And I, I want to be the first one in there, but if there's someone in there already, so I'm already freaking out. I'm like, first class at the school thinking I'm not going to be able to do this and I'm pacing outside the window on the third floor the, at the School of Arts to Chicago. Nobody else up there and this door is like lava to me. I do not want to touch it. I do not want to go in there and I'm starting to feel anxious and then I look up and there's that kid that was at my round table just like coming down just like walking down the hall and I'm just like are you going in here? And he's like yeah this poor kid. I was like <laughs> I need someone to know my story in order to feel comfortable going here. I was like, I was blown up four times. Like, I lost my best friend in Iraq. I was like, I have so much going on, but I need someone to know my story in order to go in here. And I mean, he's just looking at me like, I don't even think he, he really figured out what was going on, but he's like, okay. So I walked in with him, sat down. And the very first class I ever took was a collage class. And that's what started my life into to real conceptual art, talking about stories. And the first piece I did there, um, this piece, if you can... See that it's uh, GI Joes, oversized GI Joes that are covered. And, and this was, I was still suffocating. And in the military, we actually roll around in four people. In my truck, I had four people. Uh, we call it a fire team. And if you notice though, right here, there's a foot breaking out. And that was me. That was me trying to get into the art world. I just wanted, I, at that point, I still, I knew that this was the right decision, but I knew I was suffocating myself even trying to do this. And I just wanted to break free. So these are, these are like my little call outs to, to the world to let them know that I wanted to break through and that I wanted, and I had a story to tell, but I wasn't ready at that moment yet. Um, the next piece I did in that same collage class was this little guy. Um, collage class really opened up my eyes to looking at the world as art. Our teachers would talk about how we could take things out of a magazine, we could take symbols, we could take colors out of everyday life. I started going into uh, stores and just seeing stuff that I've never looked at before and be like, that actually relates to me. I want to use that in a piece of my art. So I started, so in this piece, uh, I did a photocopy of all my, my camouflage and I put it into paper and I put it on there and I took all these old uh, church posters out of like this 1940s catalog and put it as the base. And then if you see up here, it's really hard to see because of the angle. At that time, I didn't know that as an artist, you're supposed to document your work. So I'll just be like, oh, this is kind of cool, selfie. Um, <laughs> and so I don't have very good photos of the first few. But, um, and then you'll notice back here, there's like, this is a band playing. Uh, this is just a big gathering of people. And so for me, at that time, I still had problems with even going out into public. And I actually worked at a bar called Joe's Bar in Chicago because I love music. Uh, but I would sit there sometimes and find myself, I would start just crying or being super depressed and anxious when I saw all these people just gathered and partying and having a good time. And in my head, I was thinking like, Luke's not here to experience this. So why should these people be here? Why should I, why should we enjoy life? And I was going through all these emotions and I didn't know how to deal with it. So in this piece I talked about, and there's this weird, really weird store in Chicago where you can buy these little babies. Um, so, <laughs> so that's how I got those if you're wondering. And so I did a little Photoshop too, and I took this Introductory to Warfighting as an actual book that we get in the Marine Corps. So we study Introduction to Warfighting. So I took this as a way to say that I was never really ready. I was this baby going through this little conveyor belt, Introduction to Warfighting, coming out this soldier, and I didn't know how to deal with this because they never taught me that part of it. It was like they never taught me how to fully come home and how to create me into a person that had a good enough foundation to come back home. It was just kind of like, you're a baby, boom, you're out there in the war. And so this was another little shout to the people, letting them know how I was feeling at the time. I still never told anybody about really what this was. It was still at the time where I couldn't talk. I'd just display my pieces. Um, and then I had a, a roommate at the time. I told you, I'm art dumb. I was like, they, were, they told me about ceramics. I was like, we're making, how do you make stuff out of plates and dishes? I was like, that's weird. Like, what is that? And my buddy was like, no, it's a legitimate ceramics department. They use clay. They make these things. I was like, because my school was so small, we didn't have like a kiln. We didn't have that kind of art class. I, I was like, what? Uh, I was like, that's pretty cool. I like playing with clay. I was like, being a Marine, I was like, we play with Play-Doh and mud and anything. Um, so it was cool to me. And, and so I, I first started getting into clay 
and just feeling it. And I would sit there for like eight hours and, and I wouldn't think about anything. No war, no nothing. I just get lost in it. So I was like, I need to get into a class for, that was a great thing about SCSC too, by the way. If you're wondering, you can cross into any art form. I got in there with my drawings and paintings. I didn't touch those. You could take any class you want. So I could do performance, I could do uh, ceramics. I didn't have a clue how to do it. I was just like, this is awesome, I wanna try it. And so they allowed me to do it. And it changed my life because it was more of a therapy to me to actually feel the clay and kind of lose my mind for a little bit in nothingness than it was to, this was awesome for me because this helped me start my foundation of telling my story. The clay was like a multi-tool. It was, it was therapeutic to touch and feel, but it was also therapeutic to get my story out. But I still didn't know how to do it at the time. I went to my first clay class and I was like, I'm not going to survive in this class either because I don't know how to build stuff. I don't, I don't know what to build. And so my very first piece, and you'll still see this is, I still had a lot of anxieties and a lot of depression. This piece is legitimately like this tall, like four inches tall. Um, I dipped the bottom green and the top red because of my emotions. I was like, this is my military experience and this is kind of how I felt at the time. And one great thing about this piece is it actually opened the door to another veteran. There's only about five veterans um, at the school there in Institute of Chicago, I think, when I was there. And one other guy who was a ranger was there. And he did a lot of hyper-realistic work. He never touched conceptual. It was just all hyper-realistic. And he was very, like, off. Like, you, you didn't talk to him much because he was just like, I don't want to talk about war. He would talk about anything else but not war. We ended up being uh, roommates in our little... Um, sorry, words. I have a problem with my brain injury. I have a, like word recall problems. Um, in our studio, that's it. So we were in our studio together, and I made this piece. And it was the end of the year, and out of all the pieces I made, this is just a tiny little piece. And he's like, can I have that piece? I was like, yeah, if you want it, you can have it. He's like, and I didn't know the significance of it. He took it, and I was like, I was like cool. Well, we had, um, actually, I'll go to this next slide because it'll, it'll lead into that. So this is another piece I did with ceramics about my brain injury. So this is an IED. This is an IED shell, if you know what that looks like in real person. And I have it going through my skull and up and out the top for my left brain injury. Um, this is what, like I said, I was diving into art, trying to figure out concept and how to build and how to structure. But I wanted to get to this piece because it continues the story with the other guy. So I started with this piece. I did a plaster mold of my arm and then did a, a ceramic cast of that. And I put it up, I put my camouflage in there, and I was like, okay, I, wanna, I want to let the ceramics world know I'm coming. Like, I, this is my climb into the art world. I still can't leave the military behind. And I was trying to reach the top of it, and I still was struggling. Like, I left the camis open and empty, so if you were able to walk around it, you could see how empty it was. Um, and so we had a critique, and one of the teachers there, and so at the School of Arts of Chicago, I actually thought I was going to get a lot of pushback from a lot of the teachers, just being a war veteran. It was my... I just presumed that a lot of them wouldn't hate the stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, but I didn't get pushback at all, and it was amazing. A lot of them actually pushed me forward in my career. But I had one teacher who really didn't get this, and I think she thought it was a cop-out, and she was, she was like, no. She's like, I don't understand what you're saying here with this whole climbing to the art world and stuff. And the veteran that I gave that piece to, he's like, I get it. He's like, this is where I want to be with my art. He's like, everything that this says is how I feel. I just can't talk about it. And right there, I understood why he wanted that little piece because he was still going through it. He still did not know how to talk. Even though he's in art, he didn't know how to talk about his own feelings. He had nobody there to kind of guide him. And I was so glad that I was able to give him that piece without even knowing because it helped him in the future keep talking about it and just baby steps, baby steps. That's all it takes is these little baby steps, letting people know what you're going through but not in the grandest way, not just putting up a photo of my buddy who was shot and killed, that would do nothing for all of us. But doing these little pieces here and there is helping me grow, it's helping me tell my story. It gets easier and easier each time, and that's where that journey started for him. Um, I started getting even more conceptual, more abstract. This is a piece I did. Um, I call this, there's actually two, this one and this one. So I call it the five-year-old and the ten-year-old. So I talk a lot about a lot of loss of innocence in war, and I was still, I didn't know how to capture that. I was like, how do you capture something that nobody could see? So I started doing these series of these disfigured ceramic military people. And so I put helmets on them, I'd give them very small facial features, but everything else I'd leave very abstract. So I wanted to capture what a child would do if they saw one of these pieces, would they interact with it 
like it was a person or if it was just a ceramic sculpture with a helmet on it. And so I took both these to my nieces who were five and 10 at the time and I recorded them and I don't have that recording with me but I recorded them painting these so the 10 year old did this one the five year old did this one and you it blew my mind that they were like oh my gosh i'm gonna paint his helmet green i'm gonna put peace signs up. they were referring i never once said this is a him or this is a soldier or this is a marine they just felt like this was a person they were like i'm gonna put peace signs on his helmet and they were just painting them up all these different colors of just beauty and it almost made me cry because i'm like that's the innocence that i lost that's what we lost as humans and um, to capture that with them was just, it blew my mind and I was so happy for the outcome because you never know the outcomes when you try these little experiments. Um, and I was definitely happy with these. I started diving in more into this, this theory of loss of innocence and I wanted to take symbols of my childhood and put them into symbols of what the, what the new me looks like. Um, and I have one of my best friends who lost his leg in the war. A lot of people don't see it when he has his camis on. A lot of G.I. Joes don't reflect that. And so I kind of combined the two. I made almost a life-size figure of what a G.I. Joe would look like, but I made him an amputee. And with this piece, too, I wanted to, a lot of my work is, the important part of the work is actually doing the process, like the 5-year-old, 10-year-old piece. When you see those, you don't see the process. But for me, that's the most important part. And for this one, it was also with my brain injury. I challenged myself. I, I started putting clay down. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go print off a photo of what combat boots look like so I could see exact rep come do them. And I was like, you know what? I was like, with my brain injury, I actually want to see if I could just create what it looks like on its own. Um, so this is one of those little hidden gems that I don't tell a lot of people, but it's, it's one of those things that is important to me that I'm constantly realizing what my own problems are and what I'm going through and try to actually utilize them in a piece of artwork to share with others. I started hiding a lot of art in some of my pieces. I started building more organic pieces, outdoor pieces. Um, and actually, I would, I would hide. So there's a bomb hidden in here. There's this little IED. And this was a play on for, you know, the four months I was allowed to work um, in Fallujah. I had to pa patrol MSR Mobile looking for bombs. And four of them obviously found me, so I did a pretty good job. Um, but we, we would constantly look, and they'd be in, in sandbags. They'd be in animals. They'd just be hidden everywhere. And always in our minds, we're thinking, why can't this happen in, in town? Like, why isn't it in Chicago? Why hasn't been, someone been blown up yet? Or is this going to happen? So I would hide them in a lot of my art pieces, and I would have the students realize kind of everyday things. They'd never know which pieces I'd hide them in. But one of the first pieces I did, which I didn't ever document, was a bunch of posts. I did a bunch of these posts that you'd see in Iraq, and I made one of these ceramic bombs, and I put it behind it. And I made the class, so the class didn't know I was making that bomb. They saw the posts that I was making. And so for a critique, I made all the students walk right through it. They walked all the way through the post. And then at the end of it, I was like, now look behind it. I was like, that's a bomb. You're all dead. And you, some of them bust out into tears. And, but for a split second, they understood what I went through. They understood that everything was danger to me. Everything, there could be something hiding behind everything, my hypervigilance. And what happened was actually my hypervigilance went down a little bit. As more people knew what I was going through, a lot of my anxieties, depression, anxiety, or yeah, everything went down, and it was amazing. And it was, and to know it was all because of this, these big chunks of art I was making. I was like, how is this? How is this healing me? I started. I dived into some installations, and I didn't know what insula. I went back home to my art teacher, and I was telling her I was doing installations. She's like, what's that? I said, you're a horrible art teacher. Just kidding. She was awesome. Um, but so I had to explain to my art teacher what installation was. So this actually leads into the reason that I created this was so successful was I had a teacher who loved a lot of my work and she had this little office space on the dean's floor and she was like hey I'm doing this little installation because obviously it's art school so every every teacher there is also an artist or and every admin worker is an artist so she had this little office she's like I want to do an art exhibit there so she does two has two artists show their work uh, each month and so she wanted me to do a piece, and so I had to come in there, and everybody that doesn't know about installations, you don't really know what you're going to build until you see the spot, because you're building it into the spot. I did a lot of work with helmets, um, and I left them white for this loss of innocence and this purity, and uh, so they're all unnamed, but they're ceramic helmets that you can actually walk up onto, so they'll support, even one of them will just support anybody. And so I decided to take some of that work I was doing and put it in here because she had this admissions, uh, these admission folders with some students' names in it. 
And so I decided to take all the people who died that semester I was in school, and I wanted to enroll them in this school, almost like they were enrolling. So I call this piece Late Admissions, as like a late husband or someone who passed away. And these, to me, represented all the students that would have went to school, but it also represents that they are physically supporting the students that are there today, whether they like it or not. And it's because of them that they're there. And I just wanted people to know that. I wanted people to start conversations about that. Let them know that the war was still going on and people were still dying. Um, that led to a direct meeting with the dean um, because the, the vice dean, I think that's what you call it, assistant dean, came down the hall. She saw it. She's like, who's this artist? I want to meet him. I came up to the office. She busted in on the dean. It was just like, hey, you need to see this guy's work. And, she, and he came in there. He stood up on some of the helmets. And he enjoyed it. And little did I know, when I left there, uh, she went into the vice provost's office and said, if Richard Casper ever comes to you for anything, just do it. <laughs> just let, like, we want to embrace this guy if he comes back. Um, and that wasn't a story. I didn't even know that story until way later, until the creative it started. Uh, I want to move on to some of the pieces I did post-school, because this is, this is important to me, because I'm always still healing. After I, I graduated the School of the Institute of Chicago, uh, I was still, I was probably at 85%, so I'm at 85% from that, or 85 from that 9 that I was, so I was still living life, I was able to go out in public, I was able to speak to people that are still a little bit missing, um, and it wasn't until Creative Arts was actually formed that I really got that 95% back, but I had an opportunity at a gallery showing two years ago, I knew that my gunner's mom was going to be in the room, and so I decided to make a piece for her, but without telling her what it was, it was actually for me, but to me, abstract, this is, um, this is the bullet that killed Luke. And so I made it, obviously, I made it a lot bigger. It would never be able to actual fire. I used rifling to kind of signify it, and I used a gunmetal black glaze, but there's a, a butterfly on top. And I, used, I really dived into what symbols mean. And when I researched about the butterfly, it said in the Native American culture, a butterfly was a, a warrior who fought in battle. If you see one lifting up off the ground, it's that spirit, warrior spirit going into the heavens. So to me, that was that, that piece I wanted. I didn't label it. She walked around the whole gallery, and, and she saw every piece and went through it, and she left. And that's all I needed. I never needed to tell her what that was about. I just needed that piece to live in the same room with her because it was like I was telling her. And then that moves on to... Um, Wait, what's happening? Let's cross this one off your list. This thing's saying something weird. Uh, remind me tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it was an update. If you guys want to update your computer tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then there's this piece as well. And this was the same time I was making this. It's hard to put, so I'm going to talk about Kravitz in a little bit and how it all came to be. Obviously, this is a part of it. So these are post creative ets. So this was actually while I was creating art, and I still, I'm there talking to these veterans about what they're going through, and I'm still feeling my own emotions. And so I was creating this piece. None of the veterans knew why I was creating this piece. And partially I do it so they could see structure, but part, partly is because I need to express something too. And it's really hard to see in this photo too, but right down here is not even probably like a half an inch or an inch thick that's supporting all this weight. And it, it actually comes to a curve. So it actually makes you anxious when you see this piece like it's about to fall over, about to break. And that's the great thing about art. The piece doesn't have to look like anything. And when, uh, when you go into art place, or if you go into a museum and conceptual contemporary art and you see a piece that makes you feel weird but it doesn't look like anything, that's what the artist wants you to do. They, may, they want to make you feel a way. I wanted people to feel stressed because I was so stressed out doing that whole class. And I wanted people to feel stressed. So when they come up to a piece of mine and it evokes an emotion, that's what I'm trying to do. I just won because I got them to, to evoke that emotion. They could be like, that's a stupid looking piece and walk away. But I know that they felt anxious about that piece being there. And that was the whole process. But this became something where I was, I made it kind of a bust. And every time I would get into these, these really down moods, I would actually scrape pieces off of it. And I'd put them in this bucket that was being supported just by this. So it was every time something happened, I would, I would see how far I could go before I broke. And so I kept doing this, I kept doing this till the end of class where I, I ended up blazing it and firing it and, and putting it in there. But I didn't tell the students of that class about that piece. Um, I ended up, the next class when I was doing a little portfolio review, they, we talked about that. So they, I think they knew the whole time what I was going through, but it was just, it was nice to know that they knew that I was still suffering too. 
but that they can get to my level just by keep doing art and just continuously do art. Um, if you end up watching that time documentary, that was a little teaser earlier, there's a big portion in it that I actually didn't even realize that I've never talked about in any of my speeches because it was a lot for me. It was art for me. Um, it was, I have a field out in my, my hometown where I just have all my art pieces. All my ceramic art pieces are just surviving the Illinois winters and summers and Illinois winters and summers again. And for me, I wanted all the pieces to go there because I want them to feel what I felt. I want them to go through their own little deployment. And I wanted all of those, I wanted to see how they were all affected by it. I wanted to see if one of the helmets was affected by the storms differently than another one. And that's actually what happened, depending on where they were in the old barn structure. Some of them were completely green, some of them didn't have a scathe on them. And that's kind of how PTS affects all of us. Some of us come back and we, we're all green. Some of us, we're just white, it's like we're just going through the motions. And it's every time I go home, I, I just love seeing it. And that time documentary captured it so well. And so I have a few of those photos that I'll scroll through real quick. It's hard to see them at night one time in the winter time. So that's one of those pieces I showed earlier, the feet. There's another one. This is all like in the field in an Illinois winter, which is pretty horrible. <laughs> and they all survived. And then... Uh, Real quick to lead into creative ads. I'll probably go over time, but <laughs> really quick to lead into creative ads. This photo, I did a little bit of photography too. And this veteran right here, Jesse, was the very first veteran to ever go through a creative ads program. And that's why I want to include this in some of my art talk. <clears throat> but also, I was on a Harley next to him and I set the cruise, this little throttle lock, and I just turned and started taking the photos in case you're wondering how that photo got made. <laughs> um, and we're just riding in Illinois. And, I call it Freedom Ride because Jesse came back from war. And if you notice, he has burns all over his face and arms, and he lost his leg overseas. Um, but this is the happiest time he's ever been. I mean, you could just, you could feel the freedom. And this is just, I wanted to capture everything. And it's also, where does the machine start and where does he stop? I mean, we, we do so much with our Harleys, but now you see Harleys on his leg. So is this a part of the machine or is it part of him? Or is he the machine? It's just, everything about this photo, I just, absolutely loved um, and this is also the reason I ended up starting creative it's because he was the first one willing to come down with me to Nashville to, to write with a songwriter before anybody else would I just came up to him and started talking to him about songwriting and I was like have you ever thought about songwriting as an option I would love to take you to Nashville to write with some writers because previous to that as I was going through my whole learning about art I was also learning about creative writing and songwriting I was learning how to play guitar. I was just kind of teaching myself, and I kept writing this song about Luke that just didn't live up to what I wanted it to live up to. And working at Joe's Bar, I was able to talk to a songwriter named Mark Irwin, who has eight, nine number one hits, I think. And uh, I came up to him. I said, I have so much inside of me. I need to get out. I've been trying to write a story about my buddy who died, and I just can't do it in the way that I want to. Can I come to you in Nashville, and will you help tell my story? He said, yeah. I was like, this is crazy, this guy's going to write with me. So I traveled to Nashville and wrote with him, and it just it changed my perspective. And I thought, if three hours we can get my story in such a way that I want to share it with everyone, can we do this with other veterans who haven't been studying art for the last four years and still make an impact? And so Jesse kind of was my lead into that. And I let him know, I was like, I don't know this is going to help you. I know you hate telling your story. Um, I just want to know if... if you'd be willing to come with me to Nashville and write a song about what you went through. And his love for music outweighed his anxieties about telling his story. So he's like, heck yeah, I get to go down and write music with a number one, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we're on to something here. Um, I wanted to lead, this is so hard to put this anywhere. So this is veteran statistics with suicide rates. Um, there's 20 suicides a day. It went down from 22. This is the latest update as of 2017, even though it says 2014. Um, and it's just so hard to put in there because me and Jesse and everyone else could have been a statistic. And I knew that was a problem when I, when I graduated that school and I knew that art was an option, but I knew people like me and Jesse don't just jump into art. I was like, who's going who's gonna to lead us into art? I fell into art. I was, I feel like I was in so many paths and I just kept choosing the right one that led to art. I was like, what's going to choose a path for Jesse if I don't come in here and, and try to get him to do this? So this is 
one of the most important slides, but I always, I'm like, where do I put this in? Because it's so heart-wrenching. But that's why we do what we do, and that's why I founded Creative Ets with Linda Tarson, who's the co-founder. Um, after Jesse's trip to Nashville, where we sat down with pro songwriters and, and told his story, he was like, that three-hour writing session did more for me than the six years I've been at the VA hospital. This is a guy who is just, when he talks, he puts his head down. He's just like, nope, I ain't talking to people. But when he got in that room and he was just saying, you know, people didn't understand when I came home that when I had to go to the bathroom at four in the morning, I had to crawl to the bathroom floor because I couldn't put my leg on the time. It's like, people don't see that, me crawling on the bathroom floor. They don't see the war when I close my eyes. And so he's telling the story just down in his chair to these writers. And all of a sudden these writers being awesome Nashville writers they are, they're like, how about this, man? Hey, boy, you're looking good. You know, we're glad you're back. Yeah, I heard you got hurt real bad. And they're playing guitar to it. He hears his exact words in the song, and he just perks up, and he's like, this happened to me, this happened to me. Stuff that he was never able to tell his wife, that he's like, I can't tell her this. He texted her the song after the session. He's like, babe, listen to my song, because it's not his story anymore. It's his song. This is a little bit of, of Jesse. That's his little saying right there. A little photo thing he did. So I want to kind of capture that. I know it's Nashville. I should have brought a songwriter. I should have done some little jig, but I was just, I'm just going to play one of the songs. I want to tell you the story behind it. Um, are we good on time, by the way? Am I going like way too late? I probably am. I'm just going to keep going. Let's just keep rolling with it. I'll keep talking until you guys want to leave. Um, so creative it's right now, our biggest thing is the songwriting program. Um, it's the most attractive to a lot of veterans, but Veterans from all over the country, we pay, Creative Vets pays for their flights, their hotel, their food, all three days that they're here. And I pick them up individually and I talk to them. Before they get here, we have a few phone calls. I tell them when I go through, I'm like, hey, I was blown up four times. This happened to me, I lost my best friend. This is how I felt. What are you going through? And they tell me. A lot of times it's some of the stuff they've never told anybody. They're like, I had to shoot a little kid, but I didn't want to. Was, I didn't even know they were there and all this stuff. But I can't tell my wife that. I can't tell people that. They come to Nashville that first day we get together and we just, we go out to writer's rounds, we sit there and talk, we tell war stories, we get comfortable with each other enough to that the second day when we sit in those rooms with those number one writers or pro writers, we tell their story for them. If he, if he stops, he or she stops telling their story, that's where I pick up and I keep going with it. And uh, with Eric, it was an amazing story. The Battle of Nazaria, uh, this is the very start to the war and his colonel was like, this is going to be free space. Nazaria just pushed right through it. We're going to have no resistance. Nazaria also biblically was where the Garden of Eden was. So he's looking at this beautiful countryside. And at the time, he didn't believe in God at all. He actually told me a story about him beating up a kid for putting a cross on a, a dead Iraqi's grave. Um, and so he was like, that's how far away from God I was. He's like, we pushed through this town and it ended up being the worst day ever. He's, he's, they got so much resistance. Everyone started shooting at them from the fields that they were going at. People started shooting at houses. They were stuck in these fields. And so the Marine unit ahead of them didn't know anybody was at Nazaria yet because this is the very first, first push. And you can actually still read about this incident. So they called the A-10s, Air Force A-10s, to say, hey, just go mow down that town because we don't have anybody there. So it must be insurgents shooting civilians. Our own A-10s came in and, and killed a bunch of Marines. And he said he was in this field and he just dropped to his knees and he saw his buddies being shot left and right and he thought he was going to die and he just said he felt some sort of warmth and just lift off where he thought everything it, all of a sudden he just said everything's going to be fine and so he was in the pale horse unit and that's what i love about songwriters is the way that we can encompass so many things that are hidden to his specific story about you'll hear stuff about the pale horse that was actually what his unit name was so it makes sense to him more than it does other people but it still makes sense because songwriters are awesome at what they do. I'm actually going to play this song for you. I just want to get you a chance to, to read it while you listen to it. It's a beautiful place, this paradise. Some say the world started here. White sand, green grass, and clear blue skies Picture-perfect Garden of Eden It's a beautiful day for a firefight We know the war started here 
ashes, black smoke and bloodshot eyes it Wasn't supposed to be this much bleeding Metal rain Pouring down Putting holes in my breast In this hollow ground So I pray To survive And that the pillows That I'm rolling on Will pass over my life To say goodbye to those whose war ended here. The dog tags, tattoos, and teeth don't lie. And that's all you got left to ID them. Don't let the last thing that I see. see that just telling a story helps out so much. Eric actually wasn't even able to apply for our program. His wife applied for the program for him. He was at a time in his life where everything, he was, his wife was a 100% caregiver taking over everything. He didn't have his own phone. He didn't do email. She applied. I didn't even know it halfway through until the trip where she had to come with him. I made sure he asked if she could be a part of the session, but I said, no, it's very important that he gets through this on his own. And so she came down, she stayed at a hotel while, while he experienced this. But he went from that to now, he's already learned this song, how to play it, and he's gonna play it at the Nazaria reunion. I mean, these are, these are huge things that these veterans are doing, and it all sparked because now their story isn't just their negative story, it's this positive song they get to share with people and they know other people can relate to. So that's a little bit of our songwriting portrait. We have, we've had 51, 52 veterans come through this program, so we have so many more songs too. A lot of it is on creativevets.org website, um, but a lot of it hasn't even been recorded yet. We're still trying to find the funding to make sure all these guys get their song full production. They all get their song, but not full production like this, so we're slowly moving to get it towards there. So definitely keep up with us if you want to listen to more music and hear some of these more stories, because every story is as, as heart-wrenching as this, and, it's, I, I love being in Nashville, that's why I'm here, that's why I moved here, was mainly to recruit songwriters and keep this program alive by having songwriters who are willing to sit down with these veterans and tell their story because the problem a lot of veterans see is that they don't want to do a program that they think is going to help them, they don't think there's a problem. 
But when you say you get to come to Nashville, all expenses paid, sit down with a you know a hit country writer, all of a sudden they're like, this isn't a program. I don't care what I'm talking about. I just this is a bucket list thing. Like I get to go to Nashville and write with the number one song. Heck yeah! And it's, so it's hard to turn down. And it's not until they get here they see see the healing factors. The one great thing about this too is that while the song, the guitar I'm writing with during this program, I actually end up giving to them at the end of the program when their song's done and and say, if you're going to learn one song, learn your own song. And that's led to all, almost all of them starting to pick up guitar lessons and, and learning their own songs so they could play it for people. We just wanted to make sure that they, they keep going with it, that we're not just giving them this momentary sense of happiness. We're giving them the tools to heal themselves. Creative Vets is never, we're never in the business of healing the veterans. We're in the business of empowering them with new tools to help them heal themselves. And that's what we've seen through all our programs. Um, our art program is the next one. We have just these two programs running right now, but I have it's creative vets for a reason. I want to do everything that's creative. But these are the two main programs that we're doing right now. This is the art program. I'm going to play a little video um, so you can see it's better hearing from the actual veterans than me. So you, this is the 2016 art program. My name is Richard Casper. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I teach the course here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. This program started basically because after my injuries in war, I didn't know how to deal with myself. I came back, had a brain injury, my best friend was shot killed. I didn't know myself at that point. Art has helped me by giving me a chance to have a voice again. I used to not be able to leave my house. I couldn't go talk to people. I would physically throw up and get sick. If you could be 0% that's committing suicide, 100% being the best you can be. After the Marine Corps, after being injured, I was at probably like a 9 or a 10. And after the school, I was back to like 85% me. For people who may struggle like I did and didn't want to break out of the house and be like, I'm not sure if this is going to work, I just want them to know my story and be able to come out here and learn with other combat vets how to do art. And if they're looking for one more way, if they just come out here and give me a chance, it's going to be worth it. What we were aiming for is to express what we were dealing with, you know, when we were deployed and during our military career, where we literally get out of our element, go on this kind of like alternate reality to go back in time, think about what we went through and express it to other people. Just being exposed to different concepts of art, like at the museum and some of the contemporary art we saw, um, that's what influenced me to try doing a performance piece for my last project. The opportunity to be at the school was just phenomenal. It was amazing. We could, at lunch, we could go and wander the halls of the museums, and that was, that was pretty awesome. I think the hardest part was actually talking about what I've been through. It was easy talking with Richard because he is a combat veteran, and he has been through stuff I've been through. My job was to, you know, go find IEDs or find landmines or anti-personnel landmines and take them apart. And little did I know, I was putting that stuff inside me. At first, it's a little hard to let yourself become vulnerable. Um, you won't really know what to do right away. It takes a couple days. I know for me, it took a week. Being surrounded by a bunch of veterans that, like, know what combat feels like knows the after effects of combat, knows how it feels to come home. It was really comfortable being here. They're gonna come to class like normal college students, treated like normal people that know how to be like, I can be in college, I am a normal person, and I could live like everybody else lives. If even one of them chose to go to college and study art and has that artist brain to where it saved them, it's totally worth it. So now we have two art programs, um, one at SCSE, the School's Art Institute of Chicago, and one at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, which is the number one, number one public art school in the country. Creative Vets pays for tuition, housing, food, travel, everything. They're from all over the country. We'll fly them in from Montana, LA, anywhere. Uh, we cover everything. Because again, we never want a veteran to have an excuse to not want to seek art as an option. Uh, I knew. That, when I built these programs, I based them off how I felt when I was at nine. 
I was like, what's going to make me leave this house? I was like, writing songs with someone here in Bloomington, Illinois, will that get me out of the house? No. Well, if I write with the number one writer, yes, I'm going to go to that. I was like, go and do just a community college arts class. I probably wouldn't do that. If it was just for veterans, I'd be like, ah, it's like a group session to me. I don't want to do that. But going to the best art school in the country for free and just being able to experience Chicago and other combat veterans, yes, I would do that. So that's how all these programs are set up. And afterwards now, this is actually the National Veterans Art Museum. And all of our artwork that gets displayed in Chicago, all these students, veteran students who have never, a lot of them have never even done art before. They're just trying this to see if it helps them. Their artwork gets displayed at the National Veteran Art Museum after each class. And we actually have an exhibit up right now in Chicago. Uh, it just brings a little bit more legitimacy to our program. And these veterans now know that their, their story and their piece is worth something. And one of these pieces, actually two of these pieces, has now been acquired by the, the, the actual museum, which is unheard of because it's from a veteran. Is actually this piece right here from a veteran named Gino, who had never done art before. And his buddy was shot and killed inside. His buddy was shot and killed beside him. And the great thing about this program is that I do, just like the songwriting program, it's still individuals. I do one on one speeches, or I do one on ones with every veteran through our program. So if we have eight veterans, nine veterans, one day I'll spend doing one on ones with each one of them, helping them see what their story looks like in art. So with Gino, he said he's never done art. He's like, I don't know how to do art. I've never touched a paintbrush. I don't know, I don't know what ceramics are. I can't do this. But here's my story. My buddy shot and killed beside me. Um, when he was shot, it was in this cornfield in Afghanistan, and we had to move him to a pomegranate field to be medevaced. Um, he's like, his dying words were, I just love my life. I don't want to die. I love my life. And he ended up dying in my arms 30 minutes later because it took that long for the chopper to get there in the pomegranate field. And so now he doesn't look at pomegranates the same. Pomegranates are his trigger. He says that if he went to a supermarket and he was shopping and all of a sudden he saw something that had pomegranate juice in it or pomegranate, he would drop all of his stuff and just freak out and he'd leave. And he'd never be able to, he never was able to process that. And that was just one of his many triggers. So what I try to do is dive into what that trigger is and help them express it through art. So he's never done art before and I'm trying to teach him conceptual art. I can go, I could take anybody into a museum and try to teach you modern art, but unless you get what their story is, you're never going to really grasp what it is. So what I do with these veterans is I tell them what their story looks like to me in art. And I told him, if you want a minimalist piece, I was like, your story could be as simple as having this corn stalk with this in parchment or, or writing that says, I love my life that leads to this pomegranate. And that could be your story going from this is where he was shot to this is where he died. I was like, but think about the process. Just thinking about that 30 minute time frame. Why don't you either write something 30, 30 times or why don't you do it for 30 minutes? And I give them a little bit, just enough. And I say, you can't use this as a piece, but I want you to build off of this. So all of a sudden their brain's going, they just saw what their story looks like in a, like in a minimalistic piece. And so he just ran with it. He ended up, he wanted to do this painting. It's really hard to see right here, but right here is this, um, he did a plaster mold of his hand that sticks out of this wood wall that has pomegranate seeds that lead to the floor with the pomegranate. And for he set his timer for 30 minutes in red paint. He wrote, I love my life. And when that 30 minute timer went off, it was right there. And he just smeared it. And when I went in to check in on him, he was actually on the floor with all this red paint on his hand. And he was crying. And I was like, are you OK? He's like, I just realized that this is, where I w this is what I look like when he died as well. Like It wasn't just the painting that he was making. His arms were covered in red paint. Um, and he put this up and he actually, he was calling me. He's like, Richard, there's no pomegranates anywhere. He's like, I went to Target. I went to Kroger. I, I can't find pomegranates. And in my mind, I didn't even want to be like, told you so. But it's, it was true. Like he already started to transition his artist brain where he's taken that one trigger and turned it into something beautiful. And now he's able to live his life a little bit better. And then he'll find another trigger and do art about it. And then it's almost like the snowball effect. You just attack one thing, you just put it aside, attack the other thing. All of a sudden you see all these things start falling off of you and you start seeing what you see now as someone who had to do one-on-one -on -one speeches to being able to speak in front of you guys today. Um, and so I just commend people like Gino who took this risk and he said, you know, it's just combat vets in Chicago. I thought it'd be a good time. So I decided to join and ended up changing his life. And this is uh, the last photo I'll show you. I'm already going over time, but I want to answer questions too if anybody has them. But I want to include this because this piece was very important. This is another veteran who, my corpsman in Iraq, who is, it's a Navy doctor. He worked on my buddy who was shot and killed. 
I reached out to him because I was referring people to the program that I knew have been through some stuff. And I said, you want to go through my art program? He said, no, but I have this guy who I think should. Um, it's a Marine I served with, and I think he's, he's not feeling very good right now. And I know he likes to draw. So I had him reach out to that guy, and the guy told him about this. Go to school to Chicago, full free. And um, it's all combat vets. So he did. He came out. He made this beautiful piece, and he's the one in that video that said that he was putting all those pieces inside him, so he disarmed bombs for a living. So he made ceramic bombs. You'll see them right here. These are ceramic bombs that he made. And, I mean, seeing this guy work, too, when he, he got to the ground and he treated this like a bomb, he was putting wires in. He was like, it was amazing to see, but he hid it in a lot of trash and put a big oversized clock for, like, the timer. Um, and he put a ceramic heart. It's really hard to see this, but he put a ceramic heart that tied it all together. All the wires went into the ceramic heart. Um, two days before the class ended, he came into my room. So I live in the dorms with him. We all get single-person rooms in downtown Chicago and just so I could be there for them if they ever need anything. And he came into my room and he said, I just wanted you to know that when Doc Cameron contacted me, um, I was actually selling all my stuff because I was going to kill myself. He's like, my kid's being raised by someone else, and I was just going to sell all the stuff I have and give it to him um, so he can have a good life and I didn't feel like I had a sense of worth I can say now he's never been to college before this program never even never touched college he thought it was impossible to go he's in his fourth semester of nursing school after this program I mean it like that was the first time in my life that I just I broke down and I was like this works I knew that it helped me after four years of, of doing it but I was like how do I even in my own head I was like I designed this three-week program but it's three weeks enough can this actually affect someone in a way that will save their life and through Marco we saw that it absolutely does so I just want to leave you on this note that art is an option and that every veteran deserves a chance to try it and that's all we're trying to do with creative vets is is have that opportunity that's enticing enough for them to, to take that next step and then I'll, I'll leave you with um, this, which is my contact information. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, email, um, chat about anything, I'm an open book. But uh, I'll also leave it open to if anybody has any questions for me. That's my speech. Oh, shit.